Alrighty. So thank you everyone for coming. Um, we're here to talk about Kellogg Middle School today. Um, so I'll give a very brief introduction. We'll get more into the project later. Um, Kellogg Middle School opened up um, its new doors in 2021. Um, before that, it was closed for about 10 years. Um, and it is the first completely new building that Portland Public Schools has built in over 50 years, which is very exciting. Um, it also has a goal net zero. Um, I believe it's carbon neutral or it's goal carbon neutral. Um, so it's done a lot of work to be sustainable and renewable. Um, it's also done a lot of work to create just a really wonderful space for students to come and feel comfortable in. Um, and I'm really excited to kind of talk about the project and get more into it. Um, Alrighty. So the agenda today, we're going to do a little bit of an introduction and then we'll have a panel discussion and then um, some Q&A and the introduction will include a presentation um, by Deb France and she'll go into more detail about the project. So Solar Oregon, hi, I'm Kate. Um, I'll be kind of the panel discussion person today. Um, Solar Oregon is a 42 year old nonprofit. Um, we focus on education, outreach, community and advocacy. Um, we offer how to go solar plus storage webinars. We also offer solar tours. Um, we have a solarized campaigns that we're working on um, and then just general peer to peer education. Um, so our next event is actually a showcase in person at the new day school. Um, so this is going to be on June 28th at 6 p.m. Um, I will drop some links into the chat a little bit later so you can go to our event right and um, register for that, but it's really exciting. It's a cool space. Um, so you'll get a chance to see that in person coming up. We also wanna thank Energy Trust of Oregon. Um, Energy Trust of Oregon is an independent nonprofit. They help us do our work and make everything we do possible. Um, they serve customers in Portland General Electric, Pacific Power, Northwest Natural, Cascade Natural Gas, and Avista. Um, they have a great programs, a lot of great programs for homeowners and business owners trying to get into solar. Um, I'll also put some links to some of their um, information in the chat as well. Um, okay, really quickly, I just wanna go over kind of the rules of today. Uh, so we will be having a Q&A at the end of the panel discussion. Um, if you wanna use the chat, that's totally fine. That's great. Um, we do ask though, that if you have any questions, you put them into the Q&A and we'll get to those a little bit later. Um, so as we go through, if anything pops up, just write it down and put it in the Q&A if you get answered. That's awesome, but if it doesn't, we wanna make sure we get to those questions later. Um, I'm also gonna pop in some polls really quick. So we just kind of want to know the demographics that we serve and the folks that are coming to this. So if you could please answer those polls, I'll let each one run for about a minute. So we've got two here. I'll launch the first one. Okay, great. Then I will launch the second one here. And then these are all totally up to whatever folks wanna say, um, but we do appreciate it. It helps us do our work and make sure we know who we're serving and who we can serve better in the future. Awesome. Okay, cool. So some quick introductions. I'll go through the panel. So um, let me get my little thing up. So we've got Aaron um, Pressburg, who's with us today. Aaron Pressburg is the Senior Program Manager of Energy and Sustainability at Portland Public Schools, where he leads the district's efforts to combat climate change by reducing greenhouse gas emissions in our schools and promoting resilient, inclusive, sustainable buildings. He oversees energy management, race, uh, waste reduction, green schoolyards, and climate resiliency programs. Aaron specializes in integrated projects combining energy efficiency, indoor air quality, and maintenance needs to ensure the best outcomes for students, staff, and, cli and the climate. We have Riley Loveland here. So Riley is a senior project uh, manager at New Buildings Institute. It's a national nonprofit organization dedicated to working collaboratively with industry, market players, government industries, energy efficiency advocates, 
and building professionals to promote advanced design practices, innovative technologies, public policies, and programs that improve energy efficiency at the highest level and decarbonize the built environment. At NBI, Riley focuses on carbon neutrality in schools, which includes work developing educational opportunities and resources for a better understanding of healthy, energy efficient, carbon neutral schools. Riley is also the co chair of Oregon Green, School, Green Schools Board. So, yay, Riley. All right. And then finally, we have Deb France. So, Deb is the founding principal of O Planning and Design Architecture, a firm in their 18th year. She is a visionary and challenge-driven leader. Deb is a natural yet persuasive communicator with a unique ability to inspire and energize individuals to work towards a common goal. O's mission is to reduce the impact of built environment on the planet so that humanity can live in balance with nature. Deb's personal passion is to help expand and strengthen leaders in the industry who will continue to address challenges of climate change and social justice in the AEC industry. So thank you all to our lovely panelists today. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can see everyone's lovely faces. And I'm going to do, 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 have folks go around, if you could just introduce yourself um, and kind of tell folks here what your role was in the project and what you worked on specifically with the Kellogg School. So why don't we start with uh, Aaron, please. Hi everyone. Um, so I, I wasn't involved in day to day on the Kellogg project, um, but I am involved in anything related to energy and sustainability um, as it relates to PPS. So. Um, I would, you know, go to any design meetings as it related to uh, mechanical, electrical, or plumbing, um, a lot of lead stuff, a lot of decisions around um, solar and electrification on the project. So um, I was, I'm kind of just like an internal consultant um, to a lot of the bond projects that we have at the district, which, in, which included Kellogg. Um, so not day to day, but I was very excited to be part of the project. Riley, if you want to go. Sure. So I'm the one here who was not part of the project. I'm just sort of the national and Oregon based uh, schools person, I suppose. Um, however, I am a firm follower of all the work that Portland Public Schools has done and this project. So I'm just sort of here as the like, as the uh, school design expert, I'll say, but I was not directly involved in this project. But Obviously, this team here is stellar, and I'm excited to be with you all. Got it. Hi, everyone. Uh, I was involved day to day. So our firm was um, brought on early in the assessment of the existing building. And once the bond passed and it was determined to move forward with the new design, we worked through all the design phases, the engagement, and throughout construction. So it's real real great to be here. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you all. Um, Deb, if you want to share your screen and get us in that presentation, that'll be great. All right. Can everyone see that? Okay. So I am going to share a few slides and tell you a little bit about Kellogg Middle School. And um, the story of Kellogg really begins with an understanding of the existing site. So on the left there, you see the original 1917 building that was adapted and renovated over time with updates in the 60s, um, actually 50s, 60s, and 80s. And as I mentioned in my intro, Portland Public Schools did a great job of looking at uh, analyzing reuse of this site and building or replacement. And it was determined um, for a variety of reasons that replacement was the best path forward. So on the right, you see the image of the, the new building with the green being the three-story learning suites fronting Powell, which was a city of Portland requirement. But that also provided a nice buffer as you turn into the site, the orange being the main entry and the commons with administration and that purple color there being the gym, um, which is right next to the fields and the performing arts spaces. Because we demolished that existing building, we paid very close attention to how to do that in a sustainable manner. And so 10% of the existing building had been reused, 19% donated, 
there was a high percentage of recycled and only 1% of the building went to the landfill. And so at the bottom of your screen, you see that's the equivalent of 137 seven Boeing 747s that were diverted from the landfill compared to one school bus. And on the left there, you see uh, an example of that recycled and, and reused. The original entry was adapted inside the building to the library. And this image shows you a, another example. The floating ceilings there were uh, reclaimed gym flooring and there's a variety of locations in the extended learning spaces where they were reused. So in the new building design, the primary objective was to get the energy use to be as low as possible um, through smart building design decisions, and then make up the difference with uh, renewable energy so that the project could be net zero energy. And all of those smart decisions impacted the, um, the building envelope, the energy use, the natural daylighting, the displacement ventilation, the night flushing, all of them work together to get that energy use down to its minimal level. And then the solar um, on the gym was installed as part of the original construction. The solar over the learning suites is uh, is expected to be installed and the building has been designed to meet that need. Structurally, um, it can take that capacity. There's infrastructure there for, um, for the, the solar systems and uh, the connection plates on the roof are, are in place. So this hopefully will happen in the future. We also have a demonstration solar panel down in the learning garden, which is, this is an illustration of that garden. On the right there, you see two of the specialty classrooms have roll-up doors that lead onto this garden. It's secure and students and teachers can use that demonstration panel as part of the curriculum. And this is that garden just as construction was finishing up. And this is a view from one of those specialty. This is the art classroom looking out into that garden. So it really has a lot of wonderful opportunity. Engaging students in all of, all of the um, opportunities that the building offers was part of our goal. And so you see there are 11 different categories there on the right that translated into over 150 learning plaques. And there's kind of a few examples of those learning plaques on the left that students can see throughout the building and outside on the site to help them understand all that went into the project. And then on the lower left, there's a sample dashboard, um, which is just now being finished for the project that will display in the main entry, but it's also available to teachers um, in the classroom to bring it into the curriculum with a lot of real-time data on the solar performance and energy use of the building. In addition to energy, uh, the building design took into account biophilic design strategies. And so there's some examples here with the uh, Fibonacci in inspiring the student un union plaza, um, natural feathering impacting or design influencing our design on the siding, and the tree burl um, really being a reflect, reflecting itself into the main stair. We also lined up the wayfinding of the building on the first level, second and third with um, elements of our earth. And so the earth's core being the red earth, uh, earth surface green and the earth's atmosphere being the blue. And the students are already enjoying this. This is that um, Fibonacci spiral at the student union and in laid into the, the curve there are quotes. Um, there's one by Barack Obama. Those quotes were selected by students as part of the design process. And so here's the uh, main entry into the building. You come right through the secure vestibule into the heart of the school. And that looks out on the left to that student union space. And this is what it, uh, the final solution after construction. And uh, we've heard great things about 
the performance of this space, but also um, about how it's working from a student wellness point of view. And that stairway that uh, was inspired by the tree burl. And another graphic that shows those three layers of the school, these are also um, used for extended learning. And uh, our areas where teachers can bring students out of the classroom to enhance the learning experience. And on the ground level, um, here is an example of those spaces where they have whiteboards and, and soft seating. So the educational experience can be adapted to different circumstances. The hallways that lead um, to the classrooms also reflect that theme from that, that floor. And the specialty classrooms downstairs. Moving upstairs, the extended learning areas got a little bigger and um, reflect the theme of that floor. So here you see the second floor and some of the environmental graphics that were put on the walls to help engage the students as, as they're walking through the building. And this is the third floor with the Earth's atmosphere and the environmental graphics for that as well. In addition to those themes, we have the history of the Kellogg building um, right at the vestibule into the gymnasium with a depiction, a graphic depiction of the original building and a section, architectural section through those walls and the shields that were salvaged from the original building. And that leads right into the gymnasium and performing arts space where there is a, a, some a original tree that was removed from the site. We milled it into the bench here in this space. And that leads to this uh, music room, which is adjacent to the stage, so it acts like a green room, and there's the stage right off of the gymnasium. Um, the gym serves two classes during the school day, and that wall is a very specialty wall that provides acoustic separation, so the stage can serve as a third classroom during the day. But then when there's a performing event, that wall opens up and the stage opens right out into that gym space. And the students are getting great use of that, including using the gym for um, concerts during the pandemic. And you can see all these students are practicing good, safe social distancing. So I've got a few parting shots here and then we'll get to our discussion. This is looking back at the building through the student union. And you can see on the right there, that commons area and on the left, the learning suite. And this is right at the intersection of Palin 69th with the obelisk that really um, serves the public. The school district decided that because we really wanted to bring the public around that corner and into the main entry in a, in a graceful way, that this corner element um, should be given back to the community and, and a nice place for the community. So we're, we're really happy with everything that um, was done with this project and, and all the team members who helped to contribute and make it possible. I just want to express my gratitude too. That's it. Thank you so much for that. Um, that was really wonderful. It just got me thinking. I grew up in Portland going through Portland Public Schools. Um, I went to Chief Joseph when I was in elementary school and then I went to Harriet Tubman Leadership Academy of Young Women when it was an all girls school. Um, and just looking at those spaces, I, I, I loved my, my growing up experience, but I would have loved to have access to spaces like those. Um, that was just, it's just really incredible and what a gift that these students get to be in such open and, and beautiful spaces where you guys have been so intentional with the design. Um, it's just such a gift. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Deb, really quick, do you mind making me the host again? Thank you. And then I'll get into some of these questions that we've got going on. Um, so really quick, what were some of the challenges and some of the successes of this project? And then just to broaden it so other folks can join as well. Um, what are some of the challenges and some of the successes of other projects or, or other things that, that are kind of in the um, zeitgeist of, of this change towards greener schools? 
Well, I'll start and and then um, I, I think the biggest challenge for this project, honestly, was the pandemic because it happened right during the middle of construction. Um, and I have to give Todd Construction um, and, and Portland Public Schools a lot of credit for working through the impacts and um, early on employing real safe construction strategies on site so that the cost didn't escalate. We ended up after a lot of worry and concern um, meeting our budget. So the project did make concessions for um, construction premiums because of the pandemic and we still were able to stay on budget, which is really amazing. So it was a challenge and a success. Great. I can speak next. Well, first of all, I want to say I've presented on this project with Deb before and I've been involved with it, of course, but I learn something new every time I hear Deb talk about it. So um, it's just, it's a great project and I'm, I'm really proud to be part of it. Um, but yeah, I think Kellogg is, is a great example of what can be done even if you don't have robust standards in place. So something that the district was going through alongside the Kellogg project was developing energy and sustainability standards, which I actually worked on with Riley. Um, and it, we kind of used Kellogg, like we were running in parallel on the schedule for both of these projects. And we kind of used Kellogg as an example of like, look, we can actually do this. Um, and if we have a standard in place, we know we can definitely do it because that'll be the standard. Um, so Kellogg was just a kind of a great example of, of how that could be done um, and, and without being over budget too. Um, so I am very thankful to the project for that. Um, but for challenges, I think just in general, this isn't really specific to Kellogg, but just in general for, um, for new construction and you know, trying to build a high performance building and make it as sustainable as possible is, is always you know, just cost trade off. So we deal with, um, you know, do we wanna save cost up front? Or do we wanna save costs in the long run? And sometimes, that question is kind of answered for us because the budget is what the budget is. Um, so that's kind of our ongoing battle um, between my team and the and the construction teams is like, you know, we're always pushing for like, you know, we got to prioritize life cycle costs and long-term um, operations and maintenance and energy savings. Um, and sometimes the project team is like, well, you know, this is the this is how the budget's set and you know, we, we can't really do much about it. So um, I would say that's kind of the the ongoing struggle that, that my team sees. Mm -hmm. I can add to that. That was like a perfect segue, Erin. Thank you. <laughs> because the biggest barrier that I always hear, not just in Oregon and Portland, but everywhere, of course, is the, the great funding question. And especially recently, because there's this sort of misconception about how much, how much funds are actually being moved through schools. I know, for example, one of the we had a bunch of bonds pass in the state of Oregon in May, which is awesome, but then we had a few that didn't pass. And one of the biggest reasons was this misconception that the federal funding is just like throwing money at schools and schools have so much money. We know that's not the case because it has to be carefully planned. And you know, a lot of that money is used not just for capital construction. So when we're talking about capital construction like this, a lot of the funding is not allocated for that. But we know that the physical built environment is arguably one of the most important parts of the student and the you know staff experience if you don't have a lovely building or just a building that has like good air and good light and anything it's really hard to be productive both from a staff and student standpoint so oftentimes capital funding gets overlooked so that's always one of the biggest barriers we run into and you know in the case of portland public or in other school districts planning and making sure that these types of projects are sort of in the in the hopper is a really good way to make sure that the construction is sort of held to this high standard and making sure that, you know, Aaron mentioned we were working on these standards in parallel. So a lot of times the school districts will like put these standards out there first so they can be used for bond costing so that when it comes around to the actual project districts or, you know, construction managers, whoever it may be, aren't like, well, I can't do a carbon neutral school, it's unfunded because you talked about it before, or even a, you know, a net zero school or just a really efficient, healthy school. It doesn't have to be this like great goal, although we really wanna go for carbon neutral, I will be honest. So just planning and ensuring is a really a good way to make sure that your district is on track or your school is on track. And 
ultimately going, if it's a new construction, this is the caveat, going all electric can save the district a lot of money. I know that Aaron talks about, you know, over the lifetime of a building, but if you don't have to put in new gas infrastructure and you've got this all electric project, you're already saving money up front. And if you have a modernization, if you're, or a modernization or a retrofit, making sure that you're just kind of using every opportunity you have to drive down your energy use and your gas use and things like that also, also saves you money over time, especially if you're planning, like I mentioned. Well, that's great. Um, that kind of leads me into my, my next question, which uh, let's see if we can, well, uh, it's, a, it's a tough question just because there's a lot going on. But Aaron, I'm curious if you can kind of explain some of the policies that that brought us here. And I know that those are changing. So maybe explaining a little bit some of those changes. Um, again, I know that's a large question, but I, I know there are some, some changes that have happened, I believe, even before this project and then since this project has happened. Um, so if you could just walk us through some of those and kind of moving into the future. Yeah. Um, so in the spring of 2020, we adopted what we call the PPS Energy and Sustainability Standards, which is what I was referencing before. Um, so this takes in effect any, any project um, on the 2020 bond and, and moving forward from there. Um, so basically, um, the reasoning why we wanted to do that was because we were seeing project teams kind of, you know, pick and choose what they wanted to do. They weren't prioritizing EUI, you know, they weren't, they didn't really have a standard for like what solar looks like on a building and how we use the, the funds for that. And, you know, we just wanted to kind of standardize, like what does a high performance building look like and what should, what should the district be prioritizing in terms of um, energy and sustainability uh, in our modernizations and new construction projects. So um, it starts with setting an EUI target for each type of project. So that takes into account, is it a K-5? Is it a middle school? Is it a high school? Is it a completely new, new build or is it a modernization uh, or major remodel? Um, thanks, Riley. Um, so, you know, it has a bunch of statements on there. It ties in, um, it ties in lead and it ties in the uh, state of Oregon's green energy technology requirement for public buildings. It ties in energy trust of Oregon. So there's all these other processes that, that these um, projects are already having to go through. So it, we kind of made it sort of a guideline or playbook um, to help go through all of those processes in addition to having some project requirements in there. Um, so that was the first thing. And then more recently, uh, we had a board policy pass, which is essentially the district's climate action plan. So that covers everything from committing our operations to go carbon neutral by 2040. Um, and it commits us to phasing out natural gas equipment in our buildings, um, talks about climate justice and education, student engagement. Um, so it's really a kind of an overarching um, climate policy for the district. Yeah, thanks for thanks for walking us through that. Um, and then we talked about this a little a little bit, um, but I'm just kind of curious what student involvement, maybe Deb, you can talk about this a little bit. Um, what was that like? And, and then also, um, because students have since moved into the building, if you have any insight on kind of how they've responded to the space, um, if you have any feedback from that yet, I, I'm very curious to hear. Absolutely. So we were at a little bit of a disadvantage starting the project because the site was vacant and had been for a decade. And so we didn't have a student population to pull from like some, some other projects have had. We didn't have a principal, we didn't have faculty to pull from. And so to compensate for that, we, we really pushed hard in the direction of building a design advisory group that was led from people in the community, parents, um, other teachers from Portland Public Schools, and uh, even business owners in the in the nearby community, and uh, and we expanded our engagement to some of the other schools around Portland Public or around Kellogg. So, in particular, I remember a presentation to the students at Bridger, and um, and I was so excited to show them where we were with this project and just to watch their enthusiasm. I expected a lot of excitement to come from the students. And, and what, really, um, what really surprised me is that their focus on their questions were all about safety and security. And I expected that because safety and security 
was a big part of our design process and an important part. Um, and we address, I, I expected to address those questions, but they kept circling back to that topic, even, even after I had addressed those questions. So it tells us a lot about what's in the minds of our students and how important safety and security is to them. Definitely, yeah. And, and we've had conversations about that and just, um, it's something that's becoming more and more uh, part of the, the conversation as, as these schools are getting built and retrofitted, um, which kind of, you know, leads me to the next question, but how can other projects really learn from Kellogg um, or learn from this process that, that you all kind of had a hand in? What are some kind of takeaways into, into the future that you guys are gonna look at Kellogg and, and use? So for me, um, it just, it shows that you know, I think it's our lowest EUI of any of any of the new construction projects. So it shows that that's possible to do that within a budget. It shows um, that it's possible to do an all electric building and to actually save on upfront cost uh, by doing that um, in a new construction project. Um, I think those are kind of the two biggest things that would have been like completely shunned like five years ago. You know, it would have been like, oh, well, that's impossible. We can't, we're not even going to look into that. Right. Um, I think, you know, that has a lot to say about the project team, um, both on Deb side and on the PPS side. Um, but I think that um, it also, you know, when we were developing the standards, it, it enabled us to kind of have that example so that when we're pushing these standards, we can, we can tell the construction team, hey, like, this isn't just made up. And we know, and we're not sure if we can do it. Like we have an example alongside um, to really show that it's possible. I would just add to that, that um, I, I think of Kellogg as a stepping stone. We really want to achieve even a lower EUI and, um, uh, you know, more, carbon neutrality in terms of what we're investing in with the building materials and, and how we're analyzing the materials. There's better programs out there now for us in the design profession to, um, to look at different roofing systems. One roofing system can have a huge impact compared to a different another one. So we're really happy that Kellogg is carbon neutral in its operations and, and it's all electric. Um, and I, I think that there's still a lot more that can be done. And we're willing to share this lesson with anybody who is interested. Um, and Riley, how has the, the movement um, to create greener schools, how has that grown nationally? Kind of what have you seen and, and what's, how is it growing still? It's actually a good segue because I was going to add on to what Deb and Aaron said that I think one of the really unique things about this project, because, you know, I'll be honest that when we're talking to schools either in Oregon or in other states and we say like there's a school that's a new construction in an urban area, people's eyes often glaze over because they say like it's a big district, there's more money there, it's a new construction that's arguably easier to get to carbon neutral, which in some cases it's true. Obviously you're starting from a blank slate instead of dealing with existing infrastructure, but the like major reuse aspect, the community that this is in and just the community visibility and the amount of like feedback that was in the community and all of these things, I think make it really unique. So being able to talk about that stuff when I'm talking to other school districts or other, you know, like state officials, that really makes people like interested in this project in particular, which is a really unique thing. So, you know, what we're seeing, we're seeing this movement, this carbon neutrality and this interest in efficiency and really prioritizing the health and the safety of occupants as the movement. More and more districts are doing what Aaron and PPS did, where they're adopting policies and resolutions and standards. And that's really the most effective way for a school district to, you know, get this kind of work done and hold not just themselves accountable, but hold the design community accountable and hold their community accountable. and things like that. So we're working with districts all over the nation that are doing the same thing, not just in urban areas, not just districts that recently have passed a bond. That's like where we're really seeing the movement because like I said, the health and the wellness and the productivity of occupants is like, like we build these buildings for these kids and the staff. We don't build them to be buildings. So making that the priority has been the biggest shift. 
and then putting that in paper and making it a little a little bit more like technically sound is how we're really seeing this movement increase. I mean, we like, for example, uh, a lot of school districts do, Aaron mentioned a policy, a lot of school districts will do a, a carbon neutral resolution for the carbon neutral by, Aaron mentioned 2040, 2045, mid-century, whatever that looks like. And so we're starting to track those. And I add like one, sometimes two a week, which is rad. That's, that's perfect segue into the next question. Um, in your field, what do you folks think are the best next steps for school, uh, sorry, for the design community, the school community and others to ensure healthy and efficient schools kind of become the norm? I think Riley just answered it. I mean, oh, yeah. I think, you know, having those policies in place, like it makes my job easier too, because I can just, you know, people are used to saying, oh yeah, Aaron, he's, he's of course he's going to say what he says about energy and, you know, efficiency, but um, now I can say, well, the board's saying it, you know, this is, this is a board policy now it's the highest level of the district. Um, so that's, that's really, you know, the best way to do it. And I think, I think that making it about students, making it about the future, you know, climate change is here, it's happening, it's only going to get worse. So, um, and, and, you know, for us, for our students, that's really important to them too. So it makes it even easier for the district to support it when it's something our students are, are very vocal about. Representation makes a big difference too. Having someone like Aaron in his position has influenced Portland Public Schools and where we are today. And so I just want to give you a shout out, Aaron. Good job. Thanks, Deb. Um, and then my, Riley, I feel like you already answered that question so beautifully. So I was gonna say, I'm, I'm not going to repeat it again. <laughs> um, uh, if we just want to go around really quick and even just based on the presentation or if you've seen the school in person, um, I'm just curious what everyone's favorite feature is on the school. Um, I know, tough question. I think I really liked, this is a simple thing. I liked that that log that was being sat on that was part of the old, I just like the history of it. I also love any space that um, combines nature with the school just because um, growing up in Portland, nature is such a big part of you know, outdoor school or, or all those things. And, and it's it's any time it can be combined and because it's so part of the culture here, combined into the day-to-day -day, um, kind of comfort and care for the students. I just thought that was a wonderful, small, but very powerful part of the school. So yeah, that was my favorite. What order do you want us to go in? Oh, yeah, whatever. Deb, if you want to go next, you, you're definitely the most familiar. Uh, well, I, it's, it's a really hard question for me to answer, honestly, because the learning environments are really spectacular, but I would say the biophilic design is also one that really touches me, and there's so many aspects of that in the building and that connection to the environment um, right up there at Modest. Great. Um, selfishly, for me, it's, you know, our first all-electric building, so that's the easy answer. But I think architecturally, I really like um, the theme of the three levels of the learning suite. Mm -hmm. um, and not only just to connect it to nature and, and you know, the surfaces of the earth and everything, but, um, but just like wayfinding too, because there's so many schools that I've been in, you know, we have 90 plus schools and I've been in so many where I don't even know what floor I'm on. Sometimes I don't even know what school I'm in. <laughs> I'm like, these all look the same. Like, I don't remember, like I have a picture in my head, but it was like, what school was that again? Like, I don't even remember. So just having that, like, you know, different colors, different themes for the floors is a really cool feature. Hmm. I'm gonna like plus one and to that one where like, the, I love the theme of the floors. I'm a geophysics major by trade. So I love that that one floor is about like the mantle and the core because my interest was sparked by this random encyclopedia I found in our school that we had, but no one, you know, that wasn't immersive. It was just completely random. And to have it so immersive on every floor, I think is really cool. I like that one floor in particular, but I think my favorite feature is just the fact that it's so visible. You drive down Powell and this like building pops up and you're like, whoa, what is that? And to me, it looks like a school. Oftentimes schools don't look like schools. Aaron said, you know, he mentioned that a lot of them look the same and a lot of them just look like a not 
not like a place that I would want to spend all day. And this building is so cool. And just, you know, you can see it from across and you start to see the solar panels and you start to see the green and just everything about it, I just think is really neat and really immersed in the community. Great. Well, thank you guys all for sharing that. We've got um, a couple questions in the Q&A box, which I'll go through. Um, and then if people have more questions or, or anything they want to put in here, please feel free. Um, but the first question is, does reusing a material save cost as well as reducing embodied carbon? Or does the complexity of it increase the cost? So we did an analysis of this. We actually had to create um, a schedule for reuse so that the contractor um, who did the demolition could store the materials with Portland Public Schools in a safe environment. And then we could incorporate those materials into the design. And as you can imagine, the demolition happened before the design was complete. So we didn't know exactly how we were gonna reuse all those materials. We had to make um, some well-informed estimates and, and we were able to use everything that we had hoped to use. But there is work in salvage. So it's not, um, it's not a cost increase. I can say that with some um, assurance. It's also not a significant cost decrease. It's really kind of a neutral. Mm. It looks like Riley might have a question for you. Riley, you can, you're welcome to, to ask that now. Cool. I have a question for Deb because we were, I use this, or people ask me this all the time, all over the place, but this one really struck me because we were at the groundbreaking ceremony for Kellogg, yeah. however many years ago that was. And a community member came over and kind of accosted me about why we weren't just modernizing the current building, you know, the classic, like it's wasteful to build something new and a waste of funds and the, you know, kind of classic gut reaction. But I would love for you to talk about why this was a new, con maybe Aaron can answer this too, like why you chose to go new construction and why that is not always the, the correct route, but in this case it was. It's a great question, Riley. Thank you. So Portland Public did a, a pretty deep dive on reuse of the existing building. And the outcome was it would cost more money to modernize that building. And for a variety of reasons, the building was compromised in terms of moisture. Um, you know, there was a lot of infiltration. And so materials inside were um, in bad shape. Uh, the structural stability of the existing building would have to have a whole seismic upgrade. And even when you did that, the, the only part of the existing building that we would have recommended salvaging was the 1917 building because it had that, that old brick schoolhouse style. Um, the gym would have to be demolished and rebuilt because it didn't meet the program needs for a gymnasium. And so there was there, there would have been an addition anyway. And um, there was asbestos and abatement and, and it would have been really difficult to get the accessibility. The, the old Kellogg school was on about four different levels and none of them were met with accessible access. So Riley, it was kind of a combination of those things and, um, and it resulted in actually a cost increase to salvage and reuse the existing building. And it wouldn't have been as ideal of a school. You would have spent more money and not had that really perfect school. So it was Portland Public Schools choice and, um, and that's what they chose to go forward with in the bond. Oh, such a good answer. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's a great answer. And I'll just add more generally. So we do that with every bond project, right? So um, whatever project is next, which for us will be Jefferson High School, um, there, there's a really in-depth analysis, like Deb said, you know, figuring out pros and cons to each option. Do we tear down and rebuild or do we, do we gut it and modernize it in some way? And sometimes that looks like, you know, just a small piece of the building stays and the rest gets like added onto with new new construction. So it really is site specific and there really is a lot of different factors that go into it. Um, really quick, sorry, uh, for the attendees, I just posted the second poll. I forgot to do that earlier. So if you could just answer those questions, that'd be super helpful. Um, and then we've got another question in our Q&A. Is it possible for students at other schools to advocate for green retrofits at their schools? Or are these best 
are, are these types of projects mostly driven from PPS itself because of how they're funded? It's kind of who can get that conversation started? Yeah, I can speak to that. So for bond funded projects such as Kellogg, um, those are already decided beforehand. So, um, you know, our long, long range facility plan that was the one that was done back in 2012 told us that um, or committed us to doing all of our high schools first. Um, and a big reason for that was there's some of our oldest buildings and uh, we wanted the most number of students to experience a modernized school by the time they graduated. Um, so that would give, you know, more students a chance to experience that. Um, so now that we've done all but two high schools, um, sometimes we sprinkle in middle schools like we did with Kellogg and that was a decision made based on enrollment shifting. We needed, you know, enrollment was growing in Southeast Portland. So we needed to open up a new middle school. And we're also converting away from K-8s and more to a K-5 in middle school model. Um, so there's, there's like enrollment factors that go into these decisions too um, on the bond side. Um, but as far as um, other retrofits, we do have, you know, capital funding available outside of the bond um, that we use for energy efficiency projects. Um, and those are, you know, sometimes we get requests from schools to do projects, but they're mostly driven by um, just, you know, cost savings and energy savings that we'll see on projects. So we'll go out and do a bunch of studies and energy audits and figure out um, where we wanna do the next lighting project or the next um, HVAC retrofit. Um, but they're, they're mostly driven by the district, those type of projects, at least. We have a lot of volunteer projects that are, you know, more green schoolyard or murals and, you know, things like that that are driven by schools. Um, but some, most of the larger retrofits are driven by maintenance needs or facilities needs that we, um, that we get through facilities condition assessments or, or any kind of study that we do with the district. Um. I recently went to an event at Robert Gray Middle School and um, the students there were running a campaign to get solar on their roof, which I just thought was so insightful in a way that I was not when I was in middle school, but they had the like background knowledge to know what to ask for and then the tenacity to ask for it. And I was like, that's just, I don't know, there's something about... Um, these students where they they have access to this information and you can see that they're so willing and um, excited to engage with it. And so I think that might be where the question is coming from, but it's cool to see that there can be a little bit of that conversation, um, even if it is mostly driven from the district. Um, yeah, definitely. And we get questions all the time from students and teachers and, you know, we, you know, sometimes it's as ambitious as can we make our school net zero and, you know, we have to, we try to turn it into like an educational opportunity say, oh, well, like here's some learning tools. And I actually, Riley helped me uh, with some of that. She sent me some awesome videos that explained like what, what it takes to make a net zero school. And, you know, the principal was like, oh, I had no idea it meant like all this construction. Mm -hmm. um, so like we try to always change, change those into learning opportunities when we can um, and, and pointing them to like other schools that, that we've done that work and explain to them kind of what the process is. Um, but yeah, I agree with you. Our students are, I'm continually amazed at how knowledgeable and curious they are. And I, I was not like that when I was in, in K-12. <laughs> it can also mean, oh, sorry. I was just gonna add that what the, the one specific example that Aaron was talking about where a school was like, let's go net zero. I don't know what that means, but I'm super excited about it, which I'm all about. You can really like, capitalize on that excitement and be like, well, you know, it does involve a lot of construction and we can totally go that route in a few years. Like, well, we got it in the plans, whatever route you want to go, but you can use that to like get more excitement out of the students and the parents and the teachers to be like, let's do some operational changes. It could be like, we could put in some new LED light bulbs or like you can have your, you know, classroom patrol that's making sure that people don't have mini fridges and things like that. I mean, there's, when you get that kind of spark of some some kind of interest in your building, using the students to come up with those like action items that are that are for now is like the way to go. And that organization I chair, Oregon Green Schools, has a a program for that that you can sort of capitalize on and see what fits into your you know your needs or your interests at your school. That's really cool. If yeah, if you want to um, 
share that link. I can send it out to the participants just so they can kind of see what's going on there. Um, yeah, it kind of brings us to the end. We don't have any more questions. Um, thanks folks for, for joining. Um, thank you to all the panelists. This has been recorded, um, so it will be sent out. Um, and yeah, I just wanna say a huge thank you to, to everyone who, who spent time with us today and to the panelists. Um, this is really interesting. And as I've mentioned from Portland, so it's near and dear to my heart. Um, so yeah, thank you all. And, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Goodbye. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye everyone. Bye.